and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Tabby Chavis. I'm the director of the National Center for Institutional Diversity, a professor of education and psychology, and associate dean of diversity, equity, and inclusion for our College of Literature, Science, and Arts at the University of Michigan. Uh, thrilled and, and grateful that you have joined us today for this webinar on promoting racial equity and student mental health considerations and strategies for returning to in-person instruction. Uh, this topic continues to be timely and even more necessary um, than ever. Uh, I'm honored that this event is a partnership of the National Center for Institutional Diversity and the Race and Equity Center at the University of Southern California and the Steve Fund, uh, a longtime friend and a national organization fo focused on supporting the mental health and emotional well-being of, of young people of color. As I mentioned, the discussion today is particularly timely as campuses prepare to welcome back or have already begun to welcome back students for in-person instruction after a year and a half of virtual learning. Um, that this academic year in particular, it will also be important to redouble our efforts to recognize, attend to, and ameliorate the effects of the past year's accumulated racial trauma to the effect of supporting and promoting students thriving and healing. Can I emphasize enough that the historical, ongoing, and systemic racial violence in our society has, and unfortunately will continue to challenge students in functioning at their very best or carry on, carrying on the normal academic and social demands of college. Police killings and police violence against black and brown communities and the prevalence of anti-Asian violence, for example, have potentially traumatizing and re-traumatizing impacts for many students, and especially for our students of color. Racism is a persistent force and presence in the broader society and within all levels of our institutions and can significantly impact the mental health of minoritized students as they navigate their classrooms and other institutional and social contexts at their college or university. As such, promoting and ensuring supportive and responsive environments can better alleviate the stress experienced by students of color as well as strengthen and reframe how we define student success. As we work to create these responsive environments, we must also recognize the individual and cultural strengths that students of color bring to our campuses. They are not simply passive recipients of racism and trauma. As such, our strategies and practices should reflect an asset-focused approach. That is, we must recognize, leverage, and cultivate these student strengths to support their healthy development as students and as whole persons. Today, we are joined by an esteemed panel of scholar practitioners who will help us gain a deeper understanding of the unique racial traumas that undergraduate and graduate students of color may face in and outside of their classrooms. The panelists will also offer practical and culturally sensitive recommendations regarding how instructors can foster mental health and, well and well-being for students of color in their courses. At this time, I'm pleased to turn over the virtual podium to Dr. Carlotta Ocampo, Provost and Vice President of Academic Affairs, Associate Professor of Psychology, at the Trinity Washington University. And then she's also the Steve Fund National Advisor who will kick off and moderate today's discussion. Thank you, Dr. Ocampo, our panelists, the event organizers, and to all of you joining us today. Dr. Ocampo. And thank you so much, Dr. Shavas. It's been great to watch the chat and see folks joining us from all over the country in all different time zones and even overseas. So welcome to everyone. I know it must be late, for those of you who are overseas, so that shows real dedication. And to all of you, thank you so much for joining us to discuss what I think is probably the most important topic in higher education right now. I'm Dr. Carlota Ocampo. As you heard, I'm a provost at Trinity in Washington, DC. We are one of the few institutions that is officially a, both a predominantly black and a Hispanic serving institution. I'm so glad to be with you as we prepare to return to campuses and in-person instruction across the country. All of us, administrators, faculty, staff, parents, students, we're facing an unprecedented return in the face of COVID, a national racial reckoning, economic challenges, and so much anxiety and uncertainty. It's an honor for us to gather and explore the critical topic of racial equity and mental health in this historical moment. So again, thank you all for taking the time and extra effort to um, attend this webinar. Today's event will run for about 90 minutes. 
exactly 90 minutes. We invite you to share your thoughts, experiences, and responses in different ways uh, throughout our time together in the chat. Be aware that today's event is being recorded and may be shared in full or in part with others who could not make this time today. If you have a comment or a question but wish it to re remain anonymous, please feel free to private chat us directly through Esmeralda, who's co-hosting, and her box is called Private Chat Esmeralda. She is monitoring that private chat and will share your questions or comments with me anonymously as time allows. Note also that this is a safe space and we very much appreciate you keeping your participation and chatting respectful. We are so glad you're here again, so we'll get started. I feel a real sense of mission regarding our webinar today. As a college administrator, I'm charged with providing safe space, safe spaces and positive learning and working environments for all post COVID. So many of us, students, faculty and staff have experienced trauma. Yet I lift up our students of color with particular urgency. We've long known both conceptually and experientially that systemic inequalities impact our BIPOC students at higher rates than white students. As outlined in the Steve Funds Crisis Response Task Force Report of Fall 2020, which by the way, I commend uh, you to read that report. It's available online at the Steve Funds website. Um, the COVID crisis has thrown our racialized society's fault lines into stark relief. Our students have lived through a global health crisis, an upsurge in mass resistance to longstanding violence towards Black people following the notable police murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and so many others that we don't even have time to name, um, and, an, and an economic downturn that's placed many already, already marginalized on the very edge. As we ask these students to return to the classroom, that these classrooms have already all, uh, often been racially traumatizing spaces. So we must think carefully about how we reconstruct those spaces. Do we return to business as usual? Or do we take this moment to thoughtfully address what pedagogies, policies, and practices we bring forward and what we leave behind? Social scientists are calling this moment the anthropause, a global reduction in human activity. And we can use this moment to consciously choose how to move forward in innovative and equitable ways that are particularly relevant for supporting our BIPOC students. I'm so pleased to welcome a distinguished panel of guests with a variety of expertise to help us explore this historical moment, to name and understand what's happening to our students and how they're experiencing it, and to share strategies and approaches that will enable our students to thrive. We hope that after today's webinar, you will be able to, so here come the learning outcomes, uh, name and describe the layers of complexity and challenge that BIPOC students face as they emerge from COVID isolation and re-enter the classroom, draw connections between the external and internal pressures of this historical moment and BIPOC students' mental health, and identify and plan to practice using tools and strategies for recreating classrooms that are safe, productive learning uh, environments for um, students of color. So joining me today are three wonderful colleagues who are experts on race, mental health, and student uh, thriving. Dr. Curleen DeBlair, Associate Professor in Counseling Psychology at Georgia State University and Steve Fund Mental Health Expert, welcome. Dr. William Lopez, Clinical Assistant Professor in Health Behavior and Health Education, School of Public Health at the University of Michigan. And Dr. Stephen Quay, Associate Professor of Educational Studies at Ohio State University. Welcome to you all. So with no further ado, we want to talk a little bit about how our culture and how campus climate structures and practices impact the mental health of young people of color. I'd like each of you to talk for just a few minutes about the particular communities you serve and you study and work with. What do you see and what do you know about these communities, their classroom experiences and mental health? Let's start with Dr. Lopez. Uh, you've studied and have looked at these issues in particular with immigrant populations within which we also find many students of black and African descent who experience the intersectionality of what is being called undocu black, a black and with immigrant status. Can you talk a little bit about the challenges young people of color are facing as they head back to campus in person? 
Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ocampo, for having me and uh, great to be here today. Um, it's a good question. And, you know, I want to start and just give a little context of, of the course that I, why I'm here, right? So what, what I taught um, and why I feel I have anything near expertise um, about this kind of teaching experience that we've all only kind of collectively done for a year, right? Um, so I was teaching multiple classes during the semester in which the pandemic started. Uh, including a class on immigration, including in, and policing, and including uh, a community-based class. And both of these moved online. Mm -hmm. um, and then I taught in the summer, and I also taught in the fall. And in the fall, I taught a 200-person social determinants of health class. Um, and it's from this that I'll be drawing most of my experiences. For one, this is a really large class to have kind of this crash course of how to teach online with this different technique. Um, but for two, social determinants of health um, were literally in our faces every single day, right? And we know this is the case for many students of color all the time, um, but this extent, at least in many of our lifetimes, we hadn't seen before. So every day we came to class, we were dealing with how do we explain, um, as you mentioned, the extrajudicial killing of George Floyd, uh, the forest fires that were happening in California, the death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, um, only to list a few things, and then of course the pandemic, right? Um, and just to bring this to where you where we started, you mentioned. Um, so I was doing work with our Latino undocumented and immigrant Spanish speaking community here in Washtenaw County. Um, and so were many of my students. So we were both learning about public health and seeing public health play out on the ground, right? Um, and we brought this into the classroom very purposefully in, in ways I'll, I'll unpack today. Um, thinking about how we take these lessons to understand these experiences around us um, and how we center and validate the very real emotions, often of anger, uh, mm -hmm. that are differentially felt among our students, right? Some closer to these uh, structural violence and the social determinants of health in our case than others. So thanks for having me. I look forward to talking a lot about this and learning from my fellow panelists as well as we get ready to do it uh, in the fall. That's great. So glad you're here and, and your perspective will be so valuable. I also want to invite all of you participating to share in the chat. Um, what have you observed or experienced around students and race incident-based mental health and wellness in your classrooms? Um, what are you concerned about as you return to in-person instruction? I'm gonna turn now to Dr. De Blair. You're an expert on the experience of students of color and intersectional issues of LGBTQ plus who are young people of color. We know from research and our own experience that all students are experiencing, an increase, are experiencing an increase in anxiety and depression in our current moment. But intersectional students of color are at increased risk and more vulnerable to mental health issues than their white counterparts, including around issues of sexuality and, and uh, gender identity and just identity you know, across the spectrum. Why is this? And what are some of the phenomena these students are dealing with? Thank you, Dr. Ocampo. And, and as uh, Dr. Lopez said, it's an honor to be here and I appreciate the invitation. Um, to maybe start with the question, I might go a little bit more broadly to students of color and then um, introduce the intersectionality um, concept and how that impacts um, LGBTQ plus uh, students of color, women of color, um, et cetera. And so I think the first thing is to consider that you know campus climate is really important. And as, as folks are coming back to campus, as students are coming back to campus, I think it's important for us as faculty, folks who support faculty administrators to be thinking about the kind of campus climate that we had and maybe the kind of campus climate that we'd like to have um, in, you know, in the aftermath of, of all the multiple pandemics and traumas that, that folks have experienced. And so campus climate broadly is, is campus members, attitudes, behaviors, expectations, and then racial climate um, is specific to race. So how is your campus um, really? What are the attitudes? What has happened on your campus related to race, ethnicity, and diversity? And we know from a relatively recent survey in 2017 that 28% of students of color indicated that they felt that their campus was inclusive. Now that's in contrast to 45% of white students who felt that way. Also, almost half of students of color will say that they feel isolated on their campuses uh, versus 30% of, of white students. So we see that isolation is something that even pre-pandemic um, and pre um, the kind of, I think, increased social awareness 
hopefully, um, around systemic racism and police brutality um, was already present. And so to have those, to be holding those things as we kind of consider a, a return to campus. So why is this? And there are a few things. So incidences of microaggressions. So in my own work on microaggressions, if you ask folks, uh, students on campus to report, um, how many experiences of microaggressions or have they experienced racial microaggressions mm -hmm. over the past year, the vast majority will say yes, it can be anywhere from 70 something percent into the 90s. So, you know, students are really experiencing um, microaggressions. Um, and in a recent meta analysis about microaggressions, the impact of microaggressions on student of color's well being is, is um, accounts for 9% of the variance. So what does that mean? That means that some part of students mental health is impacted by microaggressions. And people might think, oh, 9% doesn't seem like a lot. It's more than a, that is accounted for by social support. Mm -hmm. And it's more than is accounted for by exercise. So these are things that if you said to people, social support is important, people would agree. But social support only accounts for about 7%. Um, people think exercise is important for mental health. And it absolutely is counts for about 5%. So microaggressions account for more of the aspects of well-being of students of color than some of these very accepted kind of accounts for, for mental health. Um, also, all these incidences of microaggressions can um, accumulate to contribute to racial trauma, which are the injuries caused by racial bias, discrimination, systemic racism, hate crimes. And there's not a great accounting for how much hate crime, the frequency of hate crimes on college campuses, but one figure is around 10%. So 10% of all the hate crimes that are occurring in the United States are occurring in on university campuses. So I think one of the things to consider when we talk about racial trauma is that it's not, I think sometimes it's people think, well, it's what just happens to a person directly, but we know in our research on trauma that vicarious trauma also has a very deep and important impact on the mental health of students of color. Um, and we also know from research on vicarious trauma that proximity is important. So knowing somebody, or um, being in contact with social media, which people have done and utilized more in the context of the isolation um, of COVID. All of these things can amplify um, traumatic responses and mental health, um, mental health impacts. Um, I would also note that um, when we're talking about COVID in particular, uh, communities of color have been disproportionately impacted by COVID, death of COVID, access to healthcare related to treatment of COVID. And so that's amplified, um, you know, people know people who have died, people know people who have not been able to access care. Um, and so those are ways that um, students of color can be impacted. And all of these uh, have mental health implications in terms of depression, anxiety, lower self-esteem, binge drinking, and PTSD symptoms. And then finally, I just talk about the insidiousness of internalized depression. So there's all these things that happen. And then there's the internalized piece that can happen for students of color as well. Um, and so when we talk about intersectionality, where that is, is we wanna make sure that we're not thinking of students of color as a, as a um, monolithic group, that we recognize that concerns vary by race, ethnicity, um, documentation status, um, immigration status, um, generational status, like all of these pieces. And then within groups, um, it's really important to disaggregate what we understand or what we think we understand um, within different racial ethnic groups. And so, for example, we know that um, LGBTQ students of color um, can disproportionately experience discrimination related to their multiple marginalized identities. Um, and that also, if you look at things like depression, anxiety, um, that those numbers are higher for women of color and LGBTQ folks of color. And so it's important to think about as we're thinking about ways to intervene to account for um, the differences in the intersectional experiences of students of color. Thank you so much. That, that really uh, sums it up. And I see comments in the chat that um, really appreciate some of the phraseology that you've used. I did have one question. If you could tell us what study you're referencing or what are the studies you're referencing, I think some of the listeners would like to um, be able to access those and uh, you know, study some of those, uh, those data. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, well, if you, um, I don't know, this sounds like an odd plug, but if you uh, Google Scholar my name <laughs> and discrimination, you'll see some of, some of the work um, okay. uh, that I've done related to, to discrimination and mental health. 
that's that's fantastic. So um, panelists, and maybe maybe we could get some of these uh, references to the panelists after uh, to the uh, attendees afterwards. Yes. Um, um, so that we can um, make sure that you have some of these names, but you can Google scholar uh, Curleen de Blair and you will find some of these. And you know, I loved how you commented that you know, people of color are not monolithic. And I think um, that because of the prevalency of stereotyping and, and, you know, in our society, that's very difficult. That was one of the reasons why I wanted to call out the undocumented black within the Latino community. Um, because oftentimes, you know, people think of Latinos as being a certain way. And um, Latinos are always, as are black people, as are Asian people. Um, I also wanted to highlight, um, uh, someone in the chat had said that their experience, that their Asian students right now in particular, are undergoing a tremendous amount of, um, you know, a resurgence of real, um, you know, racist um, assault and microaggression. So, you know, we just need to keep in mind that um, I think William James said that the greatest similarity we have as humans is our individual differences, that each one of us is truly unique, that each of us presents with some similarities, but we are also, you know, all a universe of experiences and feelings and emotions that, um, and as students coming back into the classroom, we will, the, these students are really going, going to want to be seen and heard, you know, for, for all of the humanities and intersectionalities that they bring into the classroom. Um, so let's uh, um, uh, turn to um, Dr. Quay. Um, Dr. Quay, you work with grad students in multiple settings and you've engaged in important research on racial battle fatigue. Um, with these students. Can you talk a little bit about racial battle fatigue and the psychological and emotional physiological consequences and why that's relevant to, to, to this moment? Yeah, thank you for that question. And it's really great to follow um, Kerleen on this question because um, a lot of what um, she was talking about relates to this concept. So I'll, I'll answer this question by sharing um, a brief story. Um, so in um, 20, leading up to the 2016 presidential election, um, I worked at Miami University for seven years before coming to Ohio State. So Miami University of Ohio, um, which is in Oxford, Ohio, a relatively small um, rural town in southwestern Ohio. And there's, there's because of the size of, of, of Miami and, and the rural nature of getting there, there's not very many ways to, to get to Oxford, Ohio. You're not driving through Oxford, Ohio, for example, like you're, you're going there as your destination. Um, about 10 minutes away from campus on, on my drives, I often passed by this um, house that had um, a Trump sign. Um, and I noticed that as we got closer and closer to the election, the size of this sign grew in, 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 in size and, and, and more of them were also on this person's front lawn. And so, you know, I, I would get to campus, I, this is about three or four days a week, I would get to campus and I just realized it was, it was about 8.30 a.m. when I would arrive on campus and I couldn't pinpoint, like I just felt exhausted. Like I had gotten good enough sleep the night before, I had eaten a good breakfast and I just felt tired when I got to campus and just really on edge. And I couldn't, it took me a number of weeks to figure out what was happening. In the span of, of this happening, I was doing some work and I came across this term called racial battle fatigue. I, I was reading an article by William Smith um, who has written extensively about this concept. And in that moment, I was like, oh my gosh, like this name, racial battle fatigue, this term, that describes what I was feeling when I got to campus. Like I was feeling exhausted and fatigued from seeing this Trump sign from like the racism that I was navigating in my body. And it's, it's sort of like now that I've talked about this concept with, with people, once you get language for something that you're feeling, it's very powerful to be able to name it and identify it. Mm -hmm. And so simply put, this concept of racial battle fatigue, it describes the exhaustion that people of color feel from repeated racism. And it's not just that folks of color are tired. Yes, we're exhausted, we're tired as hell, but it actually has these negative physiological, psychological, and emotional um, consequences on our health and well being. So, for example, um, phys psychologically, folks who are experiencing racial battle fatigue often experience frustration, shock, apathy, anger. Physiologically, we also experience headaches, grinding of teeth, shortness of breath. We might also have trouble sleeping. And then emotionally and behaviorally, um, loss of appetite, 
increased use of alcohol and drugs as a coping mechanism, um, and then poor school and job performance. And so when I got to Miami University to teach this, to teach my classes, often the classes I've, I've taught historically have been courses that are centered on issues of equity, diversity, and social justice. You know, courses that bring up a lot of emotions, in particular for students with dominant identities who are, who are navigating their privilege for the first time in many cases, right? And so those classes are taxing in their own ways. And we know historically that faculty of color who teach those courses often receive lower teaching evaluations from students, right? Because they're, they're, they're blaming the faculty member for making them feel these negative emotions, right? Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's like, if I'm already exhausted and experiencing racial battle fatigue at 9 a.m., and then I'm supposed to teach a class at 9.30 on the very topics around equity and inclusion, how am I supposed to perform at my best in these courses? And so that notion of poor school and job performance, I think is really powerful because it helps understand that it's not just folks of color or we're not whining, we're not being overly sensitive, like the things that white folks often accuse us of being when we name, when we name that we're experiencing racism, but it's that, it's that this is actually having an impact on our bodies. Um, and so to me, that's, that's another um, way to, to, to think about it. Another way I'll describe it is, I think of the notion of like paper cuts, right? And so if you get one paper cut at seven o'clock in the morning, it's not really that noticeable. You can go throughout your day. It might sting a little bit if you wash your hands, right? But then say it's like eight, like nine, nine thirty, you get another paper cut. You're going to notice it a little bit more. And then by four o'clock, if you have like say seven, eight, nine paper cuts, like now it's, it's a wound, like you notice that constantly. And it goes to that point Carlene was raising about how it's cumulative, right? It's the cumulative notion of all of these little, quote unquote, little acts of violence, of trauma that accumulate over time that then lead to this racial exhaustion. And then we're supposed to then perform our duties. Um, we're supposed to, for students of color, they're supposed to show up for class engage in research, engage in writing, as if like nothing has happened, right? When meanwhile, we're exposed to um, black and brown violence um, all over the place, like black death is being reported, shared over social media, right? And so this has a traumatizing effect on people's bodies. And so for me, I think when we talk about racial battle fatigue, it's really important to understand that it's the exhaustion that's important. But secondly, it's that it's actually impacting our bodies, again, psychologically, physiologically, and emotionally. So I, I just wanted to name that because, I, because again, it helps, I think, understand, to use Kirlene's word, the insidiousness of this racism that's, that's occurring to um, people of color. I really appreciate that framing. And I can see in the chat that people are really responding to having a name for that syndrome. Um, and one of the things that you talked about and Carlene talked about that um, has also emerged in the chat is this idea of secondary or vicarious trauma. And, um, you know, we do want to turn to the more proactive part of this discussion, but if you could, either one of you maybe take just a minute to kind of talk about vicarious or secondary trauma and how it impacts those who are observing, um, um, you know, whatever traumatic um, uh, events are occurring. Um, Carlene, why don't you take a moment to talk about vicarious trauma? Oh, sure. Um, so vicarious trauma is um, actually the symptoms are very similar to direct trauma. So a lot of the um, points that Stephen made around all the symptomatology um, absolutely still apply in terms of vicarious trauma. So social media being exposed in the media. So that's actually one thing that we absolutely know that there's a connection between um, social media exposure and uh, traumatic uh, responses. And so, um, and it's, you know, so as I shared before, it's, it's um, observation in media, it's um, hearing about something happening, it's hearing it from your friends. It's also, I mean, honestly, some of the vicarious trauma research came out of intergenerational trauma research, and talking about the ways that trauma and stress can be transmitted between generations um, within a household or within a community. And so um, absolutely, um, if you, if, in terms of what it looks like, it looks very, very similar. Um, the other part to think about with vicarious trauma is that we hold, and I so appreciated the points that are in the chat and also that um, Stephen made about, we hold this in our bodies. 
Um, and uh, it accounts, it's at least, I mean, I think the National Institutes of Health are starting to actually be able to explicitly talk about the ways in which um, the health disparities um, can be an, an aspect of accounting for that is discrimination and racial trauma. Um, and, and so, but it's partially because we, we've experienced trauma. And so when we um, have experiences of vicarious trauma, we can reenact and relive, and it can exacerbate our own experiences of trauma as well. So there's multiple avenues in which vicarious trauma negatively impact our mental and physical health. Thank you so much. Um, also, uh, uh, there have been some comments about the isolation that students have experienced um, being online, students who have tested positive for COVID and have had to isolate, students who may um, be international and feel isolated during this period. Um, can you talk a little bit, um, Stephen, about how maybe isolation also plays into this feeling of racial fati battle fatigue. Yeah, sure. So what's what's interesting about um, you know this the COVID nineteen pandemic is 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 a couple of things. One is, um, and I, I have to go back to figure out where I read this, but what's interesting is um, at the height of the pandemic when many of us were staying indoors and not engaged in social distancing. I noticed a number of Black folks in particular mention how as, as much as they didn't like the reason for COVID happening, that they were actually grateful to no longer be in outside spaces and, and exposed to, to, to white folks in particular because they were not experiencing the racism and racial battle fatigue in the ways that they were previously. So that sort of isolation piece, I think was, was healthy in that regard. As we entered, went back into society and, and came out of that, then we started to experience, you know, um, white folks calling the police for black folks watching birds in a park, right? Or um, trying to enter their own homes, right? And so that, the, the trauma started to happen yet again. And so I share that piece in part because it's this sort of like interesting thing that happened within like the, the pandemic around sort of like the, the lack of exposure to racism, which then lessened some of the racial battle fatigue. To your point though, um, Carlotta, though, the, the, the other side of that though is that um, one of the, the most pernicious effects of racism is that it makes us feel like we're alone, um, that nobody else is experiencing this. It, it isolates us. And um, it, to Caroline's point about the internalized depression, because of that, then we start to blame ourselves or feel shame for what we're feeling, which only then um, exacerbates the isolation that we're feeling. Um, and so I don't, we, we can get to this when we talk about sort of like how to combat this with solutions, right. but I, I think naming sort of like the, um, the way in which racism has an, an effect of, of making us feel alone, um, it's making us feel shame. And when we're feeling shame about something, we don't want to talk about it, even though the antidote to shame is to name it, is to give light to it. But we don't want to talk about it because, because it's painful or we feel we'll, our pain will be minimized or not heard or not validated, all the things that do happen. Um, so yeah, so I just think um, that isolation is tricky because on the one hand, the pandemic like helped minimize or, or reduce some of that racial battle fatigue while at the same time also amplifying some of the isolation which can also contribute to the feelings of it at the same time. Right, thank you so much for kind of speaking to um, some of the, um, again, you know, just the, the layers of complexity that students of color may be carrying with them as they step back into our classrooms. Um, what, and, and so I really appreciate your perspectives and there's been a very robust uh, set of chat um, ideas that I, I really want to incorporate as we go on. Um, I would like to now shift a little bit. So we've spent the first part of this event talking about kind of the context and discussing determinants of mental health and naming some of the challenges, but I want to turn now to the role of faculty and also um, how we can uh, create strategies and um, spaces that um, can um, help our students to um, um, work through and address some of these experiences where they can feel safe, where they can really learn in a positive manner, even though they're undergoing all of this. And you know, there was one person in the chat who I thought very insightfully said, gosh, you know, I can relate to racial battlefield fatigue myself. I feel that way all the time. If I'm feeling this way, how are my students feeling? You know, and I think about that a lot. I mean, here I am, you know, 
39 again and a college, you know, academic, you know, provost and all these great things. And I myself, you know, during COVID have felt, wow, you know, there's, there's really a lot of stress going on here. And our students, you know, who, who developmentally really need um, the kinds of supports around them that will promote their um, self-actualization. I think that's what we want to start focusing on. Um, so um, I wanna talk a little bit about how faculty um, can engage around students. And, and I wanna particularly talk about how white faculty can engage in supporting our students because um, I do a number of webinars, um, you know, and keynotes and things with um, you know, at predominantly white institutions that, that are increasing their people of color populations. Um, because, you know, white faculty very often feel like if they step into, you know, some of this racial discourse that they're gonna make a mistake. And they worry that they're going to um, be inappropriate and maybe microaggress or um, engage in more behavior that's gonna make students uncomfortable. And so what they may take as a protective strategy is just to kind of withdraw from the fray and just say, I have to get through this material, I just have to teach social psychology, or I just have to teach you know, chemistry, or I just have to teach whatever my topic is, without really acknowledging and addressing the students that are in front of them. And I want to say that um, as a academic administrator, one of my um, responsibilities is to make sure that my faculty, all faculty, regardless of their, um, you know, their self-identity, are prepared to step into classrooms where they are going to need to be the first point of contact for students of color. When students, when students walk into a classroom in any institution, what they see is their faculty. And to them, that faculty is the institution. And so we need to partner with the faculty to really make sure that they're prepared. So for example, yesterday here at my campus, we, um, we had a seminar uh, called Levering Critical Race, Leveraging Critical Race Theory to foster racial justice in higher education, which was, was presented by Dr. Terrell Norton, who's the um, assistant professor of identity and justice in STEM education at the University of Missouri. And um, you know, it was a it was a post-COVID faculty development day, teaching and learning day for faculty to come that provided our faculty with a safe space to explore. Um, how they are going to welcome students who are experiencing multiple traumas back into the classroom, and what kinds of strategies they could put in place to make sure that these students feel like they can continue in a positive teaching and learning environment in partnership with us and the faculty. So I think academic administrators who are listening, that's the kind of thing we need to do very consciously. We need to devote resources to preparing our faculty, including our white faculty, to welcome these students back in very, in very conscious and spoken out loud ways. Um, I, you heard me say STEM faculty. I wanna very briefly say that here at Trinity, our STEM faculty, you know, people think, well, chemistry, that's just, isn't that, you know, value free. At Trinity, STEM faculty have been at the forefront of our inclusive excellence paradigms. They um, have, um, written a huge HHMI grant, a multi-million dollar grant for inclusive excellence pedagogy to retrain, redo the entire science curriculum and retrain the faculty to be able to engage in ways that um, students of color can succeed, can succeed in STEM. And just to give you a brief um, you know, outcome, years ago, our chemistry major was almost defunct because students were dropping out right and left. Now, chemistry students can come into this major and they engage in authentic research in gentrifying communities where they do air quality assays that actually go to the city council. Um, so they're, 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 they're working in chemistry, but in environmental justice that's occurring in their communities. And boy, I mean, you have never seen students more excited to be in a classroom and to be learning because these are topics that connect to them and where they are. There's so many things that we can do um, as faculty and as teaching and learning experts to really figure out how can we engage students in meaningful learning. But that means we have to welcome them into the spaces, understand that they can do it. And if we create the pedagogies appropriately, you know, they're going to meet us um, where we need them to be. So I'm going to um, now ask some of you to, um, uh, you know, um, address this and uh, Dr. Lopez, so the, I just gave you one example, but I'd like to ask you to talk about what you think faculty, faculty can do, how they can prepare, um, what they can reflect upon and change 
Um, do, you know, do you know any working models that could uh, shift classroom environments to, to support students? Yeah, great, great question. And you know, I'm still thinking about this, this racial battle fatigue uh, mm -hmm. model and, and Stephen, your example of seeing the Trump flags you know, grow in number as you were driving. Um, and a, a big part of what I think faculty need to be aware of is that these Trump flags or these like lar these these symbols of political of what political side you're on. There's now many of them, right? So we even see the masks and the lack of masks take on this particular meaning, and and especially in particular communities, right? They have racial connotations about equality. So it's not just about um, keeping you know particular again flags out of our rooms. We need to think about all of the other types of symbolisms that that end up in our classrooms, right? Our folks wearing American flags with the blue stripe on them, and what does that feel like um, to our students of color? Um, I think you gave a, a great suggestion as we devote resources to faculty development, right? Um, and not only to faculty development, but also to their to GSIs and to the tech staff who support us. If universities have those, I was very lucky to have someone who supported me um, in being able to design our classrooms to minimize this, the chances that students will be put in these really uncomfortable positions. And I'll give one example of that. Um, so again, I, I was teaching while there was this enormous tension uh, about police violence, right, as there has been for multiple years, and as there was, again, after the killing of, of George Floyd and, and Chauvin's trial, um, and we were teaching about the social determinants of health, meaning there's different outcomes because of these racist systems, right, policing being one of them, um, and we brought up the idea that oh, policing is a, a public health issue, right, and for some students, like, well, of course it is. This is, I know in my bones, it's a public health issue. And we had someone in the chat say, oh yeah, I never thought of it like that, right? Um, and it kind of gave us all pause that there are some students from very white insular environments and there are some students from very much not that, right? Uh, who had very different experiences. And what we did, we did two things here. Um, we said, this is an important discussion to have. We're not gonna have it unprepared. Let's pick a day, devote a whole class to it, read the same things and discuss it then, right? And we did, we gave a whole class to this topic. And the second thing we did is, is aware that we didn't want to create small um, racial battlegrounds. Um, we did not just have randomly selected breakout rooms, which is many people's default when using Zoom, right? Because as I imagine my co-panelists know very well, what generally happens is the students of color is forced to defend their perspective, right? Mm -hmm. um, and just feels assaulted the whole time. Um, and so the last thing just to wrap up is, I feel like it's, it's beneficial for all of us to draw upon the readings of our field as well. We were very clear to say like, this is public health perspective. Public health believes in racial equity and social justice. And these are our grounding principles. Psychology is the same, education is the same too, right? So we're coming in and kind of recentering it for our students of color that the experiences that you have they're valid and true and grounded in the literature. And now let's bring them to the rest of the classroom. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, thank you. Those are some really great um, uh, pra practical tools that people can take with them as they construct their classrooms. Um, Carlene, do you have any thoughts about how to construct classrooms and support students and set tone? You talked about climate before. How do you address climate in a classroom itself? Um, yeah, that's a great question. I think the first thing I would say is uh, check in with yourself. So I really appreciated um, all of, of um, what um, William shared and also what you shared, Carlotta, about um, kind of specific strategies. But I also do think speaking specifically to white faculty is important and white administrators. So we talk about the isolation that students of color feel. It's because in the last, you know, oh, 20 or 30 years or so, the demographics of undergraduate and graduate education has shifted much more to about half of students now are students of color, yet our faculty don't reflect that. So our faculty are over 70% white, our presidents are over 80% white, and depending on the administrative position, the numbers get up to 90%. So we have, we're not necessarily, so, so we have, I think we need to get our, our white colleagues engaged. And so the first question I would say, just check in with yourself. How comfortable are you with discussing issues of racism and culture in your class? And like, 
in this, and it's an older study, but they taught, they surveyed faculty in 2009 and asked them, you know, how much do you think about your own self-awareness when you think about implementing diversity? And only 7% of those faculty said they reflected on themselves. So that seems like a good place to start. And when we consider frameworks, a framework that, um, I've written about and utilized in therapy training is a multicultural orientation framework, which has aspects of cultural comfort, cultural humility, and cultural opportunities. But I think those pieces are, are we thinking about in our classes where the opportunities are? I think sometimes we think, well, I don't have time. I have this whole lecture. Do you have enough time to take two minutes? And even you can say, we have a lot to cover today. We won't have a lot of time to have a discussion. But um, the people, let's look at what's happening right now in Haiti. Let's look at what's happening in Afghanistan. I appreciated somebody talking about that in the chat, right? Like, and just saying, I just want to acknowledge that that is happening. Because I think the idea that our classes occur in isolation is just such a falsehood. And so those kind of acknowledgments help to set, help to set a tone. Um, and also be ready. So be ready to when microaggressions occur, because they will. So it might be, it might be you, but it might be a student. So I think sometimes it's like addressing a microaggression is kind of like um, getting CPR training. You don't wait until somebody has a heart attack to get the training. Practice. Think about what am I going to do in class when something happens that I know is not okay? Mm -hmm. Do I ask, you know, what, what am I going to do? And if you don't know, read up on some strategies, talk to your colleagues, practice, and also don't practice on your students like of, of color and your colleagues of color, practice with some other folks, talk it through um, and be ready in that way. And in terms of setting a tone, we know that, and I so appreciated Stephen's point about naming. As a psychologist, I know that naming and putting light on something can help um, uh, mitigate its impact and take away some of the power of that. And so setting, you know, send an email to set a tone of what your class is going to be like. Talk about your pronouns. Ask students to share. Is there anything about you that you think is important for me to know and understand about you as the semester starts? Acknowledge that the uniqueness of this time. Acknowledge the stressors. Acknowledge that people are feeling anxious. Acknowledge that people might not even know that they're feeling anxious until they get back to campus, and then they might feel anxious in a different kind of way. Naming all of these things. And then we have, I, I love the pieces around the systemic changes within universities, but mm -hmm. within our spheres of influence, within as an instructor, I have a reasonable amount of, of power within my classroom, how do I want to use that power? And so, you know, setting, you know, in my syllabus, my intent, let students know that I intend to include diversity, multiculturalism, social justice topics. I intend to include underrepresented um, scholars in the work. Folks, folks that we're going to be talking about, folks who've made a contribution and maybe have been historically not included. Um, you know, talk about, I, I am a big advocate of like, to the extent possible, think about um, your absentee policies. Think about like, not everybody has access to healthcare. So asking people to provide a doctor's note is actually not um, maybe that inclusive of a practice. And then I'll also think about maybe giving people a mental health day and talking about it on the first day of class so that we can help reduce the stigma of mental health. Just kind of say, hey, we're all having issues. If there's a day that you just can't come to class, that's okay. Don't come to class. Take care of yourself. We need to do that for ourselves. And let's model that for others. Um, and then I think as, you know, so, you know, obviously there's the diversity statements. Um, there's the incorporation of, of underrepresented scholars. Um, but I think also including mental health resources on the syllabus to, again, destigmatize the idea of talking about mental health. Um, and then as, as our own, like we know that students of color do not necessarily seek out the counseling center for a lot of reasons. One of them is many counseling centers don't actually have diverse faculty, diverse staff. And mm -hmm. so what as faculty, so they can suffer in silence. So what can we do to develop our own toolkits? That's our responsibility. Do we know places that students can seek mental health services at a pro bono rate or at a, a scaled rate? Do we know folks who are actually doing good work with students of color? And then we, you know, there's plenty of hotlines that we can include, um, um, resources online. So like, I think one of the things that we can do, because we know that students of color after friends and family, the next person on a campus that they're most likely to access will be a faculty member. Um, now, faculty of color and staff of color disproportionately take on the load of that. But um, be, you know, to the extent that we can develop our toolkits um, and develop um, that setting a tone of I'm going to be a person 
that we can talk about culture with, I think um, can make a can help to transition as folks come back to campus. Great, thank you so much. You know, there's been, you said something uh, I think important about the rise in the numbers of students of color that are entering the academy and the kind of mismatch with the faculty. And there's been several comments in the chat about um, things like, um, you know, how do you have discussions about critical race theory if your faculty don't believe in it? How do you um, encourage faculty to attend these things when they're, you know, they're very low attended and it's usually those who are preaching to the choir. Um, you know, from my perspective, there's a couple of things. One, one, you know, if you can, if you can reason with people around who their students are going to be. Um, you know, I mentioned that a few years ago, our chemistry department was almost defunct because they were losing students. I mean, if you lose your students and your, part, your department is terminated, you also lose your job. You know, so, I mean, I know, I know we don't wanna kind of be alarmist with people about it, but, you know, there is a thing here about how if we don't start doing better, it is going to start impacting us, not, you know, faculty who may not identify as um, a person of color, I mean. Um, so so there is um, there's a motivation there. But, but also I think that, again, as an administrator, there has to be some kind of a reward attached to engaging in this, um, in this kind of um, professional development. I know it's, it's particularly hard with tenured faculty, but you know, administrators can figure out reward systems the the this you know the the leaders in an institution have to decide that this is a priority and then they have to set parameters and benchmarks and guidelines for all of the faculty being able to achieve what the goals are for the institution um and so you know it has to come from the top down and the bottom up at the same time that's how i view it um we've had additionally um, a couple of different kinds of comments. Um, and I think what I'll turn to next is, um, uh, 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 we've had a question, uh, Stephen, about um, would it, is it helpful to call out racist, racism in academic spaces? Um, you know, to, to just call out racism when you see it. Uh, how do you feel about that kind of an action um, having an impact on um, students of color and their mental health? Yeah, so this is a this is a good question, and it's I think it's hard to to have a, a blanket sort of like yes no response to this question about calling out racism. I think the thing that I'll the way that I'll answer it is is for me um, one of the the things that I think is really important that's a core value of mine is um, when something happens publicly, we need to address it publicly. Um, so one of my biggest pet peeves is like um, if I'm in a classroom setting or if I'm, if I'm in a meeting um, and somebody says something racist or does something racist, um, nobody in the room confronts it, in particular white folks, but then after the meeting, after the class, folks come up to the person and say, hey, like what so-and-so did was really messed up. I just want you to know that that was problematic. And I'm like, well, why, that, why didn't you say that during in the moment? Like, why didn't you say that in the meeting, right? And so to me, like, I think calling out racism when it happens is really important. So that's like one piece I'll say. The caveat to that though, is that, um, is that we have to think about like our, our privilege and power in, in relationship to this, right? So um, students of color positionally have less formal power. So that's their, their the formal power is tied to one's position or title. They have less formal power than their faculty in the room do. So I hold faculty more responsible for calling out racism when it's happening and not putting the onus onto students for doing that. Like right. students, um, you know, that's emotional labor that students of color should not be engaged in. Um, so to me, that's like that's like really important. It's like that's the, that's the work of the faculty member to do that. As a faculty member, we miss things. I don't see things at times. Just this morning, we had a welcome session for our, our students and I missed something. And so I owned it, I apologized. And then more importantly, you have to do better the next time, right? Mm -hmm. And so, but, it, but that's the responsibility of like, um, of like the of faculty members. What students of color can do though is first and foremost, I think it's really important to, to take care of yourselves. And I'm gonna complicate that in, uh, that in a minute. Like I feel like we're in this mantra of like, oh yeah, self care, take care of yourselves. Like people say this very, very glibly. And it's become this sort of like consumerized concept, but in the the, the reality of that self care before it became commercialized is really important, right? 
Um, like self-care is radical. It's, a, it's an act that we have to do in order to, to take care of ourselves. Um, some of the work that I've done around racial battle fatigue, the participants in this study have distinguished between self-care strategies and more deeper healing strategies, which are getting at the root of the issue. So self-care things are, are stuff like caring for your bodies, like exercising, eating well, sleeping well, um, seeking counseling that, that Curleen said, which can also be healing because in counseling, you're also addressing the root of the issue. But there are more sort of the temporary, temporary fixes that are, that are more quick, but, but may not get at, at the root of the issue like healing does. And so one of the things participants said was being in community with other people was what um, got them to heal, right? And so I think setting healthy boundaries is also really important. It's, it's okay to say no to things. Um, one of my colleagues, I love this phrase that she, um, that, 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 that the person said was, you don't, have to, you don't have to light yourself on fire to keep others warm. Right. And so that means you don't have to be the one who's doing everything, burning yourself out for other people to 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 be to be OK. Right. Like you get to take care of yourself as well. You get to heal. You get to prioritize your needs. So to me, I think boundary setting is really healthy because that no means you're saying I'm too important to, um, you know, to, to, to say yes to this right now. I have to step back. I have to, this is not my, my, my job. This is not my battle to fight. And I have to take care of myself. So those are some of the things that I think are really important um, for students of color. Great, thank you so much. Again, this is uh, just such a robust and amazing uh, conversation. And we are just about at the point where we have just about a half hour to go, time really flies. Um, I wanna ask one more question and then kind of switch to the uh, question and answer portion. Um, we had a question about the intersectionality with socioeconomic status. And, you know, at the beginning in my framing remarks, I talked about um, three things, the um, COVID global health crisis that's impacted our students, you know, the, the racialized violence and the emerging, um, you know, re-emerging uh, strong mass resistance. And then the third, the economic downturn. Can anyone talk about the inter intersectionality uh, with students, um, you know, who are also in a very fragile economic space um, with coming back with all of these issues into the classroom and maybe having to deal with institutional bureaucracies um, as, they, as they navigate, um, you know, this, this experience of returning to the classroom. Not sure who feels like they have an expertise in that. Um, William, Dr. Lopez, do you have sure. any? Yeah, I'm happy to get started there. Uh, and you know, I think it's it's going back to an idea that Stephen said earlier that once you articulate it, you can address it more. I, I think this is what many students with the with intersexual identities are going through is that they don't quite know where the attack and the stress is coming from, mm -hmm. um, and therefore they don't know how to address it. Right? Do you do you like actively seek economic help? Do you look for another social community online? Um, and I found that part of my role. Uh, especially in teaching in public health systems and structures. And for those of you who teach in higher ed and psych, I imagine it's very similar, um, is to show them like these are the different paths that lead to our intersectional oppression, right? This is where, um, why many of our communities are let, uh, have lower income. This is why there's more undocumented folks in our communities. Um, this is how oppression is shaped for different folks. And when they are able to see themselves in this historic position, right? So. Um, they see themselves as, as part of a larger immigration narrative, for example, instead of someone, uh, and I'll, I'll give an example, one of my students said, uh, my uncle used to work in the fields or picking, uh, picking a fruit and he would pass out because it was so hot, right? And she's mm -hmm. like, and I just thought it was, you know, he just had a low heat tolerance and it was really hot. And uh, you know, I gave her this book, uh, they leave their kidneys in the fields about heat stroke in the fields. And she realized like, oh, this is systematic, it has to do with OSHA. And while it didn't necessarily make her feel better about her uncle's relation or situation specifically, um, part of her self-care, part of her healing was addressing that system, right? And I think, uh, you know, to summarize, to the extent that we can be intersectional people, right? And, and rich and, and, and beautiful, but define the systems that oppress us very carefully and take them apart systematically, um, I think it, it's, it's helpful for students 
And it's actually, I would say, a good part of self-care that I wish we would engage more, right? Both this advocacy against what oppresses us and for people of privilege. Can you imagine if everyone of privilege, their self-care day was acknowledging their privilege and addressing what they gained unjustly from it, right? This would be a very different model of self-care in a very different world. Mm, yes, you know, I think that really speaks to how we um, uh, invite, you know, our white colleagues to engage in this discussion, particularly as they also shepherd so many students of color. Um, um, you know, I think for many white uh, faculty, they feel very vulnerable, you know, when they, when they um, uh, experience um, their, their relative privilege and what that's meant. And, you know, um, I know that a lot of faculty, of, of white faculty at my institution, sometimes, you know, in hearing some of the student stories, like what you just shared, you know, for them, it's, it may be the first time that they really, I mean, they may have seen this on TV, you know, and now they know someone who's experienced this. But uh, this also speaks to what you were saying, Dr. Quay, about um, how the, the burden can't be on the students to always be naming racism and calling it out. You know, that's just unfair emotional labor. I mean, we really need to come together as institutions um, to figure out ways for students maybe to do that in more protective ways where they don't feel they could have um, retribution from a professor, for example, if they call out uh, something that's happened in a class. So, um, you know, I think we as a higher education um, community need to think through a little bit more um, how we um, enable people to, you know, own their truths and, and talk about their truths in, in healthy ways where they're supported and, and then everybody can sort of move forward positively instead of, you know, um, the, the environment that I guess we see today every time we turn on the news. Um, so thank you so much. This, again, has been very robust. Um, we've had so many uh, comments in the chat that I can't even really think about where to begin. But we are um, now going to turn to a question and answer period. Um, and I also would like to invite each of you to, you know, think about um, anything else that you might want to communicate to the audience um, at this point. I really want to celebrate um, the asset-based direction of this conversation. You know, what we really need to see and understand um, in these kinds of conversations is that um, we're all here to support and celebrate students and that the, the measure of success for this conversation and any of the efforts that we in higher edu education take around diversity, equity, and inclusion, whatever you want to call this work, is, is students who are able to, um, you know, uh, uh, embrace their resiliency and, and achieve their goals and thrive in the academic environment and post the academic environment, because at some point they're going out into the world and they're going to be contributing. Um, and that's our goal. So um, I guess, let's see, we have a question, maybe Kerline, this might be for you. Is there any research uh, on, on the benefits of having a BIPOC mental health counseling uh, staff to serve BIPOC students? Is, is that a research-based or an evidence-based practice? Um, I think the a great question, I was trying to think of if I could off the top of my head, think of a study that specifically talked about um, mental health and counseling staff in particular, and how that might impact um, uh, utilization of mental health services on a campus. So a lot of that would just be it, my idiosyncratic experience of students kind of saying, I'm not going to, like, I look at the website, and if I don't see any people of color, I'm really not going to go there. And that's if people have been informed of the fact that there's a counseling center. So as a first generation student, I didn't actually even know that I had a counseling center on my college campus that I could access mental health services. Um, and so, but there is research that talks about um, having uh, therapists of color and the impact and so some of that research it's some of it's mixed and um but there is some research to support that having um a therapist or a counselor of color that um it can actually help kind of the therapy process and one of those being you know i know in some of my own work with women of color in therapy they'll report experiencing fewer uh, racial microaggressions from um therapists of color versus white therapists, for example, and, and that's been borne out in, in a few different, in, in different contexts. But at the end of the day, actually, white therapists can do good therapy with folks of color, which is encouraging because similar to faculty, there are more white therapists than therapists of color, which 
So we would hope that people could be multiculturally oriented and competent, but that's the key. They actually need to be multiculturally oriented and competent. Um, and our self ratings of that actually tend to be pretty terrible. So we actually need other people because, um, you know, to tell to to kind of do that work in relationship with others um, to really get some of that feedback. Because, you know, um, as Dr. Quay said, we kind of all miss things and, you know, that's okay. But it's about what we do around trying to miss less and what we do when we do miss, which I love also the reference to a good apology is really, really important. You know, like that, all the important things we learned in kindergarten, like in kindergarten, it's like, if you hurt someone's feelings, you should say you're sorry. Um, somehow as we get to being adults, it's about being defensive and giving, giving a, an account for why we caused harm. And so, um, so, so I think, um, yes, there's some research to support that having BIPOC therapists is helpful. And there's also support to say that if you have a multiculturally oriented and or competent therapist that is white identified, that the therapy relationship can still be positive. Um, but that, you know, that is going to require some work. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I see there's a comment from uh, the Steve Fund administration that there's a University of Michigan focus group report with students discussing perspectives on counseling a center staff diversity. And that can be accessed at the um, University of Michigan Health Services website and it's called Talk About Wellness. So um, I, I can certainly relate to what you stated that there, there's tons of anecdotal evidence around this. And hey, somebody out there who's interested in doing research in this topic, you know, here's a wonderful research topic for you to look into. What are the benefits of students of color having a BIPOC counselor? And what might be the benefits of, you know, a different kind of racial configuration as well? I think that would be really, really interesting to learn more about. Um, I want to switch gears a little bit. We've had some interesting comments in the chat uh, um, about how, talking about how many post-secondary institutions moved to online and distance education during the COVID crisis. And then how this change, you know, faculty, I, I heard a lot of faculty complaining about how when they had to, you know, teach online, um, they, students wouldn't turn on their cameras. And they saw that as a, um, a real negative uh, because they didn't know if students were really there or, you know, were able to uh, find out if students were really participating. Um, but there's a comment that this change allowed minoritized students to choose how they show up to class and that took away the need for code switching. So the ability to turn their camera off meant that they could focus on instruction instead of changing their natural appearance to be professional or to conform to a classroom space. Um, and also, you know, they could um, just kind of, um, well, what I said before, not code switch, at least not visually code switch to the extent that they would have to um, in, a, in a regular classroom. Um, Dr. Quay, do you have any insight into how this might um, impact students? Yeah, this is, it's a really, really good question. Um, I want to give a, a shout out to one of my um, friends and colleagues, Matt Johnson, who's a faculty member at Central Michigan University. He, um, he tweeted about, it was 10 things faculty can do um, around the, the pandemic. And I think it also turned it into a, um, an article for the Chronicle of Higher Education. But one of the things to your point, Carlotta, Carlotta that he said, and Perlene brought this up earlier too, is around um, we as faculty have power over a lot in the classroom. One of the things that we can do is to not legislate how students in our classes show up, right? And so things like requiring people to turn on their cameras to me is a, is a big no, in part because there's all sorts of thing, reasons that people choose not to. They're in their personal space. They're in their home. Like you mentioned, they don't, they don't want to have to code switch or um, or, or, you know, pre present themselves. And so to me, I think that's one thing is let's not legislate the things that allow students to be more whole, be more human. Um, so that's like one important thing. Another thing that I, I've done in my classes is on the front page of my syllabus since the pandemic started, I have a note in there that I say a note about the um, pandemics. And I use the term plural because um, the police brutality and policing has created another, I mean, this is historical, right? Another pandemic around black and brown death. And so to me, that's really important. But to me, like just that note in the syllabus, like helps students understand that I understand that their lives are, are very difficult right now. And so my expectations are not what they were previously. Like there's, we are not in a normal, quote unquote, normal time. 
So we should not be doing quote unquote normal things, right? Like let's extend some grace and patience. And it doesn't mean that we're less rigorous or that not we're, we're, we're watering down the content, right? Like we're in, in many ways where um, we're allowing ourselves and our students to like be whole and extending each other mm -hmm. grace. So to me, that's another sort of really important piece is like, how do we put notes in our syllabi around our philosophy, right? How do we change what we've been doing? How do we extend grace? And so for me, like I, if maybe you don't, you don't penalize students, you don't deduct points if they're late, right? You know, all of these things we can do like within reason, right? Yes, they're still in class, they're still getting credit. So I understand some of those boundaries there, but what does it take to us to act in more humanizing ways that I think are um, really important? The other piece I'll add to is um, one of my, I've had several students also say since the pandemic started um, that their faculty actually required more of them um, than they did previously. And I'm just like, why, right? Like, again, like, um, like I sometimes even for myself, like now that I'm behind my computer, I will schedule meetings back to back for nine hours. And I'm like, why on earth would I do this to myself? Because, you know, I don't have the time to drive somewhere or walk around and walk to the next meeting. Again, like these are the things that we, that feel simple, but really go a long way. And so again, we don't need to amp up our requirements or expectations. We actually need to tone them down to allow again, more grace and humanity for the students and what they're navigating. Many of them are parents. They have small kids at home as well and are trying to also do online learning with them, right? And so it, it acknowledges again, the various things that students um, are juggling. I appreciate yeah. that. Uh, you Dr. Know, well, yes, please. Yeah, I just wanna, I, I wanna add something to this because the, the issue of uh, turning on your camera was such a big one. Uh, one of them is, you know, I look at our backgrounds and for many students, this is the first time they've ever seen, like they've ever not been a, in a sterile white classroom, right? Mm -hmm. They see a visible, uh, you know, blankets from their heritage or Black Lives Matter poster in the background, right? And, and this is empowering the students for the, for some of them, it's the first time they've ever seen it in a learning environment, right? Um, and, and I think it's a wonderful opportunity to think about the art that we have, like how do we create a welcoming cultural space? Uh, the other thing about the camera is it's really important to, to think about the different demands of being in person, but also on a camera, right? Uh, for some, it doesn't require preparation. For others, they feel as though they need to prepare. Uh, one student told me her professor was the only man she would see all day, and she was very thankful because she didn't have to turn her camera on and didn't have to put her hijab on that day, right? So this is something that obviously I don't experience, and it's, it's just a way to kind of equalize or give students the agency to decide um, how they're spending their time um, in preparing to be seen, whether on camera or in person. Thank you so much. You know, some of the comments have also been that streaming is expensive and that asking students to turn on their cameras uh, for students who are already economically vulnerable can, <clears throat> there may be a cost to that. Um, and so I think there's a variety of reasons why respecting, you know, the fact that students are adults and if they're gonna be in class, they're gonna be in class, you know, and, and if they don't wanna turn on their camera, maybe they have their reasons. Um, in, in just a couple of minutes, I want to ask each of you for a final thought, but we've had two more questions that I kind of want to get at a little bit. Um, if So if we could do this real briefly. Um, oh, and may I say that resource that I mentioned before uh, is called Talk About Wellness. That's on the University of, Mar of Michigan's website about um, uh, counselors of color. And related to that, someone had asked, what about virtual therapy? Is that something that's helping students of color? Um, I, I'm sorry, I keep going back and forth between first names and last names because I'm just like that, but I'm Dr. DeBlair. What about virtual therapy? <laughs> um, absolutely. So I think um, I know in our program, uh, and so I'm the training director of our doctoral program here in counseling psychology, and we really had to do a real crash course and get everybody, our students trained in doing uh, telemental health. Um, and it's actually really been, I, I don't know that we're ever going to go totally back. Um, telemental health has allowed access to uh, mental health care. And sometimes those, you know, at, at, at 
it, sometimes there's, there can be more flexibility in cost because the, the therapist doesn't actually no longer needs to be able to has the overhead related to having private practice space. The other part related to what we talked about earlier in terms of having a BIPOC therapist, um, it's given people access, maybe they live in a community where they're, you know, that where they don't necessarily have access to um, therapists with particular identities. And now there's, you know, depending on licensure issues by state, there can be some variability, but it does, it does allow for, um, for access in a different kind of way and, and flexibility around even um, timing of sessions, length of sessions. And so for my colleagues who are in private practice, they also talk about the attendance in sessions has been better because people don't necessarily need to depend on. So if we're talking about access to transportation, for example, um, things like that. And so, you know, they're, they're able to, they feel like there are more people who are, are making sessions and making appointments. And so if anything, that's really blossomed um, access um, in, a, in a certain way with the, some of the limitations that you mentioned related to streaming and access to, you know, computer technology and things. Thank you so much. You know, um, wow, this has been an absolutely amazing discussion. And I think we could probably stay here for another three hours, but unfortunately our time is coming to an end in just about 10 minutes. So what I'd like to do is I did have a, a comment. I think this is more a general comment uh, from a student affairs professional saying, you know, this has been great. It's really addressed faculty and administrators, but what about student affairs? So um, in two minutes, before we turn to everybody's two minute wrap up, could someone maybe throw out a suggestion for um, a student affairs professional to adopt as well? Oops, we got radio silence on that. Okay, so let me do it this way. I'm going to ask each of you to um, maybe have a couple of minutes for a closing remark, what you would like to say. And if in that closing remark, you would like to say something about what student affairs professionals can do, um, and then I'll say something at the end about that. But um, Dr. Lopez, why don't we start with you for your um, sort of finishing up uh, remarks here? Yeah, and just to let you know, I was thinking very hard about the, the student affairs you. question is a good yeah. one. Yeah, like how do we uh, organize kind of our patients? Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> I was not ready for that. I'm gonna keep thinking on that and, and hopefully email some responses. Um, I want to go for a closing comment. Yes, thank you. I want to build on something Dr. De Blair said uh, that in your class, you acknowledge what's happening in the world around you at this time, right? To put it out there, this is what's happening. This is what we're dealing with. Um, I think this is this is great. We did this in our class too. And the additional you know, advice that I would give here is to always use it as an example to explain historically what's going on, explain from, from our backgrounds and our fields and our discipline what's going on. Right, let's talk about the killing of George Floyd, but let's also talk about Ferguson. And let's also talk about how police came from slave patrols and used to round up workers for deportation, right? Um, the, let's talk about what's happening in Afghanistan, but let's go back to Bush, if not before, and talk about US colonialism abroad, right? Let's talk about women's rights. Um, mm -hmm. When students are able to see the world around them through the, the, the systems that and the frameworks that our fields provide, I think they also come to make sense of it more, but also appreciate our fields more. Uh, so thank you for that. And, and thank you to my fellow panelists. I learned a lot from you all today as well. Oh, so appreciate your input. Dr. De Blair, any last uh, final thoughts here? Um, yeah, I think the thing that comes up for me is that I think sometimes in trainings like this, you can get an onslaught of information. And I think um, it would be great if folks could commit to something. So sometimes change happens in big sweeping ways, and sometimes it happens in incremental steps. And so if everybody on this call, and as I recall, there were a lot of them, um, you know, could choose one thing, just one thing that they could address, whether it's working on self-awareness, whether it's doing something in their syllabus, whether it's committing to talking about current events in their class, um, pick one thing and commit to doing that and maybe have an accountability partner. You know, talk to somebody else in your department, share some of the things that that are that we talked about today and talk to each other, support each other um, in terms of what we're going to do. And then let's check in with each other at the end of the semester. How did that go? And that way, when you have challenges, you can support each other in that. You, so I think, you know, to the isolation question earlier, we don't necessarily have to be alone in this work either. So committing to choose one thing, um, incremental change, do it 
check in, have an accountability partner if that would be helpful to you. Um, and then you can and then add, you know, um, add next semester. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Dr. Quay, what are your final thoughts? Yeah, thank you I'm for sure this question. Fine, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, I know my colleagues in higher education and student affairs would be remiss and probably very disappointed if I didn't answer the student affairs <laughs> question. So, um, okay. so I'll, I will take that one. <laughs> um, so I think one of the things about student affairs is student affairs is often seen like as a helping profession, right? So those of us who work in student affairs, we, we often enter the profession because we're in the business of helping college students. Um, and so what that means often is that um, we prioritize students' needs often above our own, um, above taking care of ourselves. We focused a lot today on like supporting students, on like faculty. I, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the importance of like taking care of ourselves in this process too. Um, and, and that means like seeking counseling for ourselves. Like I've seen a therapist since 2015 to deal with the racial battle fatigue that I was experiencing because I wasn't showing up well for my son, for my partner and for my friends, right? And so I, I had access and resources and that it was important for me given those privileged identities that I hold to heal, to work to address that trauma that I was experiencing. So to me, taking care of ourselves as student affairs professionals, as educators is really, really important. Um, the other thing that I'll say is, and, um, and William um, spoke to this point multiple times around um, acknowledging what's happening in our society mm. is really important for student affairs professionals and for faculty. Like, you, like we can't just go into our classroom business as usual. We can't just go into an, an advising meeting as business as usual. Like business is not usual, um, right? Like events are happening in our society constantly. We have to acknowledge it because students are experiencing that. And when we go in business as usual, we minimize what might be happening in our society and how it's impacting them. And then the last thing that I'll say on this point is, um, at this point in our time, we are in 2021, we know that students of color experience racism. We no longer need students of color to share their stories of pain or trauma for us to believe them. The reality is like we know that exists and there are resources at our fingertips where we can read those stories in books, articles, journals, blog posts, at Twitter, Facebook, any place we can access those resources. So we need not expect students of color to continue to share their stories of pain and trauma and racism with us for us to believe them. When a student of color tells you they've experienced racism, your number one job in that moment is to validate that what they're experiencing is real. I hear you, I'm sorry you experienced that, what do you need? Those are the, that's the way to respond to them, not to minimize what they're experiencing over, um, explain it away, but again, to validate in that moment. And one book I'll recommend that I think is really important for this discussion is called My Grandmother's Hands, is around um, this notion of like working to heal from racial battle fatigue. So I wanted to be sure to put that resource out there for folks. Amazing. Well, thank you so very much. And, and I have to say that, you know, in reading the chats, the audience has really, really been so appreciative of this discussion and your honesty and the resources that you've provided. I've seen, um, you know, everyone kind of just shouting out all of the panelists around, you know, these very, very important constructs and being able to really take them and use them. So I, I, I do emerge from our time together with a feeling that this has been a really meaningful discussion. Um, so thank each of you so very much. And um, in just the couple of minutes that are remaining for myself, you know, I wanted to say about um, interacting with student affairs, but I want to even say more broadly that, that um, you know, this is something I talked about a little earlier, that we all need to collaborate with each other. One of the things that happens many times on campuses, particularly around um, the mental health of students of color, of, you know, or, or anything to do with students of color, is it, is it stuck over here in the DEI office? Not that there's anything wrong with that. You know, thank God for DEI offices. DEI offices have a lot to do. And we all across the campus have to take responsibility for students of color. That means the DEI office, that means the provost office, that means the deans, that means the programs, the faculty, the staff working with students, the advisors. You know, so some of the things I talked about before, racially trauma-informed leadership, that can put into place 
um, some of these practices, investing in these practices, collaborating across offices. Don't leave it all to, you know, the director of diversity over there that was hired, you know, last year because the institution, you know, realized, oh, we need a director of diversity. No, go to that director of diversity and say, what can I help you do to increase your mission on my campus? Really um, come together as a community to make sure that we are, um, you know, collaborating together, that we lift up this, um, issue as being of primary importance. Look, these kids are coming back to us. Some adults uh, are coming back to us. The students are coming back to us and they're coming, you know, from places of isolation and stress and so much going on in the world. We know we're not feeling well. We need to be there for them and make sure that they have a fantastic landing and a really, really powerful fall semester. So with that, I would like to invite the Steve Fund uh, Laura Sanchez Parkinson, Director of Programs and Partnerships, to uh, bring our event to a close. Laura. Thank you, Carlotta, and thank you to our fantastic panel uh, and to nearly 900 of you all that joined us today. Uh, my name is Laura Sanchez Parkinson, the Director of Partnerships, Programs, and Research at the Steve Fund. Uh, we are so thankful for the partnership that we had with the National Center for Institutional Diversity at the University of Michigan and the Race and Equity Center at the University of Southern California for us to be able to continue to promote the mental health and emotional well-being of students of color. As we prepare for the new academic year, the Steve Fund is addressing the timely mental health and emotional well-being needs of students of color and equipping those leaders and educators like yourselves to support students. For faculty on the line who would like to continue to increase their knowledge and identify tangible tools and best practices for their classrooms, the Steve Fund will be hosting a two-part seminar just for faculty on promoting equity and student mental health considerations and strategies for the classroom. This will occur on September 14th and 21st. Please look out for more information on how to register for that event. It'll be a smaller event. It will be a capped uh, participation so that we can create an engaging experience for you. We also welcome you to check out our websites. Uh, so see them up in the screen, sign up for our listserv so that you can stay engaged in our upcoming events. Uh, we have a number of efforts lined up this fall and trainings, conferences, events for higher education professionals and your students. So thank you once again for joining us today. Take care and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.